Welcome to Russia on the Record, the new podcast from the Moscow Times. What time censorship laws adopted after Russia's invasion of Ukraine effectively criminalized independent reporting and led to a massive exodus of Russian and foreign media from the country. This summer, a number of foreign journalists who continued their work inside Russia despite the risks were denied renewal of their press accreditation. Two of them agreed to share their stories with us. Our guests today are Dutch journalist and former Moscow Times chief editor Eva Hartog and Finnish journalist Anna Lena Loren, who works for Swedish language media. Could you start by telling us how you got into reporting on Russia? Why did you choose Russia and why did you choose to stay there for a long time? It really was a mistake. When I was in school, we had English, of course, but, but French and German were my favorite languages. And I wanted to work as a journalist in France, which is still my dream, by the way. I got involved in Russia because I was taking part in a student exchange when I was studying political science at, at my university in Turku. And I'm, I'm from Finland, and my father was born in 39, the same year when Stalin attacked Finland. The attitude towards the Soviet Union in my childhood was absolutely negative. It was as if it didn't exist. We, we knew there was a wall, some things, and there's a big, very dangerous country, and we don't know what's happening there. It, it really was as if there was nothing east of our border. When I started to go to Russia and, and just travel and meet people, it was really, I was uh, 20, 21, and I was young, and it was this formative age. It, it was extremely important for me to realize, well, it sounds very banal now, but it had always been an enemy, and it now became a country with real people, with really high, nice people. And a huge culture and beautiful language. So this was how it happened. Eva, what about you? Something similar, I guess, in a way, because, well, I have a Russian background in the sense that my mother is Russian, but she's a Soviet emigre, so she fled the Soviet Union to the Netherlands, where I grew up. And in our household wheels, Russia was just not a topic. And when it was, it was also mostly negative in the sense of it was just something that she considered part of the past. And in 2013, I was getting into journalism and I was just excited to explore a new place. And because I already spoke some Russian, I thought, you know, let me go take a look at this place that people talk so negatively about, you know, and that's such a mystery to me. And I ended up going for three months initially on a three-month co contract. Long story short, I applied to the Moscow Times for an internship, even though I already had a pretty good job in the Netherlands. But I thought, okay, in Russia, I'll just start from scratch. And I applied for an internship. And at the Moscow Times, the, the then editor-in-chief, Andrew McChesney, he wrote back and he said, you're not getting the internship, but I have a job for you because I used to work for this news website in the Netherlands. So I knew about websites. And he said, we want to revamp the Moscow Times website and we need someone to basically steer that process. So you're not getting the internship, but I'm offering you a job if you can be here within a month. And so I had a job, I had a relationship, I had an apart I had a life here, you know, and I just thought I'm going to do it. And I quit everything and moved to Russia for those three months initially on a trial period. But I ended up staying for 10 years in the end and staying also at the paper for a very long time. So And Elena called it a mistake. I think mine was a mistake slash coincidence. But I definitely went with, as a very clean slate, with very few preconceptions, to be honest, and a lot of curiosity and a lot of enthusiasm to go explore this place and basically nuance the story that was out there about Russia. And what happened this year? Why couldn't you continue working in Russia? And while well, you got your refusal of accreditation, what was the official reason for the refusal? Well, I never got that official reason. They didn't say anything in the beginning. And I realized, of course, because, well, how it all started. On the 29th of April, I got a message from a colleague in Stockholm asking me, have you noticed what the Russian embassy in Stockholm is writing about you? And then there was this very long very toxic, very aggressive update about an article I had written about Sergei Lavrov. A really common article about the fact that he used to be a very respected diplomat worldwide and now he's Pasora non grata in many arenas. I said really nothing new about it. Everybody has written this article, but they became, became obviously very offended. And I mean, the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Russia has a department which is occupying itself with the Western propaganda. And they had found this article and I think they were quite happy because it, for them it was really a good <laughs> example of Western propaganda. 
So they made this very toxic update and the embassy in Stockholm published it right away. And if there wasn't for the war in Ukraine, I really wouldn't have cared about it so much. But since Russia attacked Ukraine, everything has changed and it, it has become a lot more dangerous to be a journalist in Russia. And in this update, they said that, well, they called my article fake. And as we all know, you can get up to 15 years of jail for fake in Russia if you're unlucky. And they also said it's very strange that she's getting her accreditation writing this terrible stuff in Russia. She can just as well write the same bad articles in Helsinki. So I, I understood that, okay, they, they will want to renew my accreditation. I left for Finland the next day, would draw out with my daughter, because even if I didn't really think that they would actually do something to me, it was a concrete signal and I thought better to leave. So I left and, and then my accreditation was supposed to be prolonged in two weeks later, but it was never prolonged and I got the message only very late before the accreditation was already expiring. We're so sorry, but you won't be able to get your accreditation in time to get your visa, so we'll have to wait in Finland. And I was like, yeah, yeah. They were quite polite there. There was no aggressiveness in, in the tone of, from the press department of the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And since then, I haven't heard anything from them. And I, I haven't been that with them either, because it's very obvious what this is all about. I think that they want us to wait and to be nervous and to maybe hope. And I don't wait and I'm not hoping anything. I, I'm carrying on with my journalistic life. I'm going to Ukraine uh, in two weeks. So that's it. He asked about a reason. I also wasn't given a reason in the initial conversations. As a quick recap, foreign journalists have to reapply for an accreditation and a visa every three months now at least journalists from unfriendly countries in Russia. And so this is a cycle you go through every three months and every three months, you know, it could be the end and then you sit and wait. But it usually isn't the end until it is. <laughs> and in this case, the last time I went through this process, I got a phone call a week before my visa was set to expire. So it was really pushing it. And I got a phone call from my contact person at the Russian Foreign Ministry. And she just said, it has been decided that your visa won't be renewed. And that means you will have to leave the country in time, basically. So don't overstay your visa. And it took me a while to figure out what was happening, to be honest, because this is, I think, Anna Lena said something about, you know, they want us to sit there and be nervous and, and try to understand what's going on. And I had a similar version of that, in short, during that conversation itself, because... No one ever said, you know, you're being expelled for this or that reason. If that had been the case, that conversation would have been over in five seconds, but that never happened. So the conversation lasted quite a long time because I kept asking follow-up questions to try to figure out how serious this was and what was actually going on. And as the question you asked me, the very simple question of the reason, you know, and who can I then talk to? And I never got clarity on that account. So basically... The only information I got was that my visa was not being renewed. And when I pressed them for who had taken that decision, they said the competently organi, so kind of like the relevant authorities, which meant that it wasn't a ministry either. So that was very vague. And then after I left Russia, Politico published a story on me being basically de facto expelled. And that, of course, uh, attracted a little bit of publicity. And when that happened, there was actually, let's say, a formal response from Russia's foreign ministry. So Maria Zakharova, the spokesperson, came out with a statement in which she also equally confusing statement, in my opinion, but in which she listed a lot of stuff about me, random stuff, including the fact that I left Russia last year and that there were some suspicions about like what I was really doing in Russia, you know, hinting, I guess, at espionage or basically discrediting my person. But the one, let's say, objective reason she gives in that statement is that no one should be surprised by the non-renewal. This is a euphemism of the visa of a Dutch citizen in light of EU sanctions and the harassment, that's a quote of Russian journalists in the EU. So I guess, I guess that's as formal a reason as we're ever going to get, but it's very clear to me, and I guess for Anna Lena it's the same, it's very clear to me that that is not the reason, or at least it's not the only reason. It's just part of a story they're putting out. Yeah, I agree. In the West, we have this idea that the Kremlin is a smooth machinery and there is a decision taking somewhere and then everybody's following it and everybody is a sure. Everybody knows what's going on. But in practice, I think it's very, it's a lot more chaotic. And it's obvious that they want a certain, at least some foreign journalists should stay in Russia. I think that this is what they want because it looks better for them. And But at the same time, they want to limit the number. They don't shouldn't be 
me. And, and of course, yes, they are very offended by Russian journalists getting kicked out from EU countries. So, and, and that, that's this uh, mentality that exactly this mirror mentality or what, what you could call it, that if anything has happened to our journalists are being thrown out, we will do exactly the same to their journalists. And by the way, that's also really interesting, this propaganda thing, because always when they are talking about Western journalist propaganda and, and what it looks like, and uh, also when they talked about my article that I had been gathering all possible lies, and uh, very obviously this was something which had been commanded. I had been commanded by my boss, and uh, this was like something some which had been you know, planned and so on. It's really funny because they are talking about their own methods. Whenever they tell us about our propaganda, they are telling about exactly the way their own journalists are being handled. So it's very comical in a way. But my point is that as long as I was working in Russia, I decided I will work as I've always been working. And I'm trying not to think too much about what could happen because otherwise you can't work. And as long as I was able to stay in Russia, I think it was an important task as a journalist. But of course, when, when you understand it's becoming too dangerous, you leave and, and, and that's it. So... I knew it all along. As soon as Russia had attacked Ukraine, I knew that I would be thrown out sooner or later. So some say that a foreign journalist's ability to stay and work in Russia depends on the diplomatic relations with their country, the country they represent in Russia and with the Russian authorities. So do you think uh, that was like your case? Well, I'm a citizen of Finland, but I write for Swedish press, also Finnish press. But my main employer is, is Dagens Nyheter, which is the main Swedish newspaper. And of course... Neither Sweden nor Finland has almost any relations with Russia now. So, yes, it has played a role. But but I think it's all part of... It's all part of... They are trying to somehow handle a situation when they are also used to the fact that there are many journalists, foreign journalists in Moscow. And and I think it's also when you have this whole infrastructure, you know, this press at jail whose mission is taking care of journalists and making accreditations and everything, I think it's difficult for them to just, in one day, dismiss everything. In a way, it's going on by inertia, I think, that they have ready systems. And, and then one after another, we are getting thrown out. And, and yes, of course, the the worst relations with our countries or our citizenship, the uh, uh, more... <laughs> likely you are to getting thrown out but but it's really arbitrary you can never know i think for me i think it's a combination of the question of who do they want to kick out and then the second question the follow up question is who can they afford to kick out so i think the nationality question definitely plays a role i can only speak for the netherlands but you know in the netherlands we've had mh17 the the case against that the trial which for some reason russia holds mh17 against the netherlands which is just yeah bizarre but there are a bunch of factors that have not contributed to great relations between the netherlands and russia and of course the netherlands is a small country so you can afford to take a step like that i think If you look at the jailing of Evan Gershkovich, for example, the fact that he's an American citizen, it undeniably plays a role. It's very important. So I wrote a story about this for Politico, about the expulsions of Western journalists since the war, basically. And I spoke to Alexander Bauna for this, an analyst and former diplomat, Russian diplomat. And he said something interesting that... Even in this aspect, the mirroring aspect is very important in the sense that this is his theory. The Russian authorities want to maintain a foreign press corps presence in Russia. This has always been the case. It was the case in Stalinist times as well, but they want to limit it. They want to contain it. And in containing it, in choosing who gets to stay and who leaves, they look at who they can afford to get rid of, basically. And I think the nationality question plays a role, but also the publication. So this is Bono's theory that the reciprocity principle plays a very defining role because they think if we kick out someone from, for example, a, a news agency, then, of course, the other country, whatever European country or Western country it is, will do the same to us. We'll take retaliatory measures. So they'll kick out our Russian correspondent in the West, and we can't afford that. And so with publications, for example, like Political, I'll just say something, or the Dutch magazine that I used to work for, the Flona Amsterdamer, there's no real Russian equivalent in the Netherlands or in Europe. And so getting rid, rid of me comes at no cost to them, And it only brings benefits. You know, that's the kind of logic. So I think that's my thinking on that question. You said that for you after February last year, when what we call 
what Russian authorities call special military operation started. You were waiting for something like this to happen, that you might be expelled. So what happened? What changed in your walk in Russia since February last year? Did it become like really difficult to report from Russia? Well, a lot more complicated. And I think the biggest difference, of course, was the fact that I started to make a lot of anonymous interviews. For example, if you make an interview with somebody in the street, well, it started to get very difficult long before the, uh, the attack against Ukraine. But people had started to become very suspicious of journalists in general and Western journalists in particular before that. But after the war started, I realized that, and I know there have been concrete cases which we haven't had before. When somebody in the street gives an interview to a Western journalist and gets in trouble afterwards, So I started to make a lot of anonymous interviews, with the exception of, you know, well-known activists who don't have anything to lose anymore, or leave people to talk about things which are not so sensitive or dangerous. And of course, it hampered my job. I don't like working that way because there's always a risk. If you don't have a photograph, a name, and a person, for journalists, this means bad because it's impossible to verify. I mean, the reader can always think she made that up. And, and, and I also got some response from the readers that you're quoting your conversations with friends. How can we know they're true? And in a way, they are right. They can't know that it's true. They can only trust me. So I didn't like this kind of environment, but I, I, I just thought that I'll just do my job as, as long as I can because it's still important to be in the country. I think it's a very good example how the Russian authorities are shooting themselves in the foot. Because when you are not in the country, when you don't talk to people and meet the people, a country becomes a monster, especially in the in this situation with, with, the, with this war. So it really should be in their interest to have people on the ground. But this is also maybe even just not a necessary thing to say because for them it's not important. They don't think in these terms ever. I think that they honestly don't understand our job. They don't believe that I'm really trying to understand what's going on in Russia. They honestly believe that I just get every morning, I get a new class from my editor, write this, this and this. And I think they also have decided to believe this is the way it works because it's easier to live if you think that everybody has the same awful working environment as yourself. It's such a familiar story, unfortunately. I think the main, just to add with that, so I completely agree with what Anna Nina said, the main difference for me was everything that I used to do before. So for years, I mean, reporting in Russia has become more and more difficult. You know, this has also been a gradual process. But February 2022 is just like this massive accelerator in a way. It's highlighted what existed before. And part of that process for me was feeling like you can't work freely in the sense of usually in an ideal world as a journalist, you can think about, you know, what's relevant, what's interesting to your readers and what deserves exploring and then go explore it. You know, that's ideally that would, those would be the action steps. And now a very important part of that, maybe one of the most important, unfortunately, in my case was I would have an idea, I would think a story is important. And then the questions and the self-doubt would start because I would start thinking, okay, is this a story that, especially since the jailing of Evan, that's worth taking certain risks for? So how can I make sure that I'm safe? But even more importantly, exactly what Anna Lena said, how can I make sure that everyone I speak to is safe and protect their identity? It's a balancing act. And of course, the stakes have become higher for everybody because the stakes for journalists are now that you'll be literally arrested, not just expelled, but arrested and put into jail on ridiculously heavy charges. And the risks for the people who speak to you are not just that they get a telling off by the FSB, but that they get charged with, for example, treason. So, you know, how can you, the, it's a rhetorical question, but I, I felt very constrained a lot of the time because I was trying to square a puzzle to get it right. And the bottom line is that a lot of the time you have to draw the conclusion that you actually, you can't guarantee your own safety and you can't really, really guarantee the safety of people you're speaking to because if you're being monitored or followed, I had this a lot with reporting trips, for example. I think a big part of being a Russia correspondent, and that's the reason why we want to be there and why we want to work there, is to go out in the field, right? Get get away from your desk and get away from Moscow and talk to someone in Khabarovsk or wherever it is. That's, for a lot of us, that's the reason why we wanted to be in Russia. And that those are the stories that nuance the general view that's out there a lot of the time because you hear different voices, you know. And reporting has become really difficult. I mean, for me, it was really a kind of constant weighing up of, 
Is it worth me going somewhere? Do I increase my risks or someone else's risks by going there? And I have to say, unfortunately, sometimes that leads to you deciding that maybe the story is not worth taking all, the, all of those risks for. So I think the in terms of output, my output was definitely less than it would have been had I been able to work freely. And you're constantly having to put a lot of work into explaining to people, to literally everybody, what you're doing. I felt a lot of the time I would have to start from zero in explaining what journalism is to basically everyone I spoke to. So you're reassuring people that you have good intentions, you know, that you're there to report what they tell you. That exactly what Anna Lena said, that you have no preconceived mission or assignment. So you head out and you're asking people what they think and then you want to report that. Uh, but I had, in my case, I even had trouble convincing, let's say, the patriotic camp of speaking to me because even though... You know, I wanted to write a story about why do these people think the way they do? Why do they support the war? Why are they volunteers? You know, this is part of the dilemma. This is part of the big question that exists in the West. Why does a certain group of people sign up for this? And in order to report that story, you do have to get those people to talk to you in the first place, you know? And so a lot of the time I felt like I was just an advocate for journalism in general. Half of the time you're a teacher, half of the time you feel protective of the people. As you can hear, there's the psychological burden, I think, of reporting and trying to just do that very simple job of reporting what people tell you. There's a lot that is involved with just writing a story or writing a, one feature from a specific place. There's a whole chain of events that you go through before you actually get there in the end. So that's definitely changed. I really am, I agree on this. And especially on the fact that you have to explain a lot. And in a way, at least I came to the conclusion that, of course, I always explain and I talk to people, but the situation had changed. And when there is a war, you can explain as much as you want. And and I really did try to make my best. But if there is a war and the person knows that my country is at war, you are still on the other side. And that's something which, which for me, I realized it pretty early, that this was nothing I ever wanted. I believe my job as a journalist, especially in this sort of situation, if you are, have the possibility to be in a country which started the war, of course, you have to report. There, there is a really a huge point in reporting from that country. And I meet a Russian in the street, of course, I will not tell them it's your fault that Russia attacked Ukraine. I would never say it. But if there is a perception that you are on the other side, and this perception, of course, it's a lot about propaganda. But the fact is there is a war going on, and I am on the other side. Then... It really hampers the reporting. I think there's really not, there's not so much you, you can do about that. And this was also a factor which made our job more dangerous because the Kremlin is, is still saying that this is not a war, it's a special operation, but everybody knows it's a war. And, and when there is a war, everything changes. And do you remember your thoughts when you learned about the arrest of Evan Gershkovich, the reporter of last German? Well, I remember my lecture very, very well. I couldn't say it was a shock because in a way it had been expected, but it happened a bit more than a year after the war started and all the foreign journalists who had stayed in Russia, we had been in touch and we had been waiting a little, what's going to happen? Are they going to arrest someone or will they just throw us out? And then a couple got thrown out and we thought, okay, obviously they don't want to have this mess now with arrested foreign journalists. And then they arrested an American. It's not a coincidence that they arrested an American. And, and of course, it's, it's, it's this whole part of the, of the warfare. So I was thinking a lot afterwards that is it really worth it to stay in Russia? I, I do admit I was thinking a lot and reflecting a lot about the situation and still deciding, okay, I will still stay. Because in a way I knew I would get thrown out anyway, so why, why leave before you get thrown out? But, but that really changed everything because they changed the rules of the game. Uh, before that, they had only thrown us out. As Eva said, they, that's what was the worst thing which could happen, could happen to you. And now... In a way, we started to be in the same situation as Russian journalists, which again made me realize that who are the real heroes in this situation when it comes to journalists? The real heroes are the Russian journalists, not the foreign journalists, because they take the real risks. And they also know the society from inside out. I agree. Yeah, for me, this is a really sensitive topic he used to work with and for me at the Moscow Times when I was there. He was part of my team. And so I knew Evan basically from the first day he arrives in Moscow. 
And I knew him as someone who was very ambitious to learn more about Russia. But when he came to Russia, he didn't know that much about modern day Russia. And he just threw himself on it to understand more. And he, as we all saw, he just, he rose to the top from, from that moment on. So he's had a great career and I've had the privilege of watching it. So I actually, I'd seen Evan about a week before he was arrested. We were at a, a dinner with friends and I hadn't seen him for a very long time before that, basically since the war started. And so, you know, seeing him again after that time, it was just in general, the war a lot of people have moved places. And so when you see someone again, it's just like it's similar to how people saw each other after COVID maybe, or you have this feeling of seeing this long lost friend and hugging each other and there's this reunion, you know? And so the last thing I remember of Evan is just this tight hug and the, the, the joy at seeing his face and just having this familiarity with him. And we saw each other in Moscow, by the way. And so when a week later, I, I think it was in the morning, yeah, because he was detained in Yekaterinburg. And then for a while, they managed to keep that news under wraps. And then the next morning, it started leaking out, coming out. And I remember I was walking on the street in Moscow and this, there was a lot of traffic. And I got this notification on my phone, this pop-up of a flash. Like, uh, I think it was an American journalist has been uh, arrested on the basis of some anonymous source, you know. And then the story started developing. And I initially, I understood that it was Evan, but when you see that someone's been detained, this is not very unusual in the sense of this has happened before to foreign journalists. You just get detained for a moment and they interrogate you on something. But I remember the moment when I, I actually texted with a friend, with a mutual friend about this, because the moment that I really sunk in was when I got another news notification and it said the FSB has arrested Evan Gershkovich and he's been taking it, taken to Moscow or something. And there was just this realization that this is really serious. I mean, this is not just a moment, you know? And next thing I knew, we saw the photo of Evan being led into the the courthouse with like a hood, hooded sweater over his head, leaning down. And it was only when I saw that picture, I'm actually getting goosebumps as I'm telling this. It was just one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen. And from that moment on, it was time just stopped for a moment. And for me, it was, you know, the, when the war started, it was a shock to my system because it, it, I had to, it changed my bearings, my view of what was possible, let's say, and not, you know, within Russia. And then this was the second moment after the war that for a moment time stopped and I just, I couldn't believe it. And I actually still can't believe it. When I went to one of his, his hearings in court, because that was one of, actually one of, one of my motivations to stay in Moscow post his arrest was because I felt like I wanted to go to his court hearings and see him in the flesh, you know, and for him maybe also to see a face he knows in the flesh, because part of the horror of this story is that most of his friends and the people he knows have had to leave Moscow. And so he's been arrested and in a way we've had to leave him behind, you know, for understandable reasons, but it's and so I, I made it a personal mission, not that it makes a huge difference to anybody, but for me, it was important to be in Moscow and just be there physically at his hearings uh, as often as I could. I only managed to go once, but even that court hearing, seeing him in a glass cage, every single time I see an image like that, it just, I still can't believe it. I know it's, but, and every day that he's there is just really hard to accept on a personal level. I just, because also aside from my personal relationship with Evan, it could have easily been any of us, you know, it's just, there's no reason why he's in the Fortovo instead of me or someone else. It's, coincidence, it's bad luck or whatever it is. And of course, it's not a coincidence geopolitically, but on a human level, it is. That, that's a very important point, I think. Yeah. That it, it's so coincidence who, who gets in this horrible situation. Of course, yes, he's an American and he's from a big country, which is more important for Russia than the Netherlands or Finland or Sweden. But for some reason, it could have been any of us. So I really, really agree. To recap it, like the two words that really come to mind for me, how I've experienced this is just arbitrariness. So it's arbitrary, everything that's going on, the whole case around him. Of course, we don't get to see the evidence because it's being held behind closed doors, which is also so typical of this time in Russia. And so arbitrary and this feeling of lawlessness, they can do anything to anyone at any time. 
and powerlessness for the people who just, there's nothing you can do, you know, and you stand on the sidelines and you kind of hope for the best. And that when that happens to someone, Annalena and everybody who's covered Russia, for years we've been covering these stories about Russians and activists and politicians. And Navalny, of course, is the most famous person. But And still, as, as wrong as this is, maybe on a moral level, but when that happens to someone you know, you personally know, it really drives home how twisted this entire system is and how little a, a specific an individual's human life matters, you know. That's hard to process and it's hard to accept. And had you felt pressure from the Russian authorities while you were staying in Russia, like any confrontations with FSB, any interrogations? So. I had, of course, like everybody, when you move, go to make stories outside Moscow in, in little places. Uh, very often FSB was following us and I, I was also taking, I had to spend a couple of hours here and there. And this was before the war. They were asking very often very <laughs> stupid questions such as, why are you not married? And it was very obvious that they had a boring life and then they found someone to talk to. That was your biggest crime, Annalena. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That you're not married. <laughs> so it was never, it was in a way a bit, more comical situations and, and hampering our job and it made them took, took a lot of time and everything had to be postponed and so on. It was very irritating and annoying, but 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 it was never threatening. So uh, that's the most thing I felt. Then, of course, I'm, I'm sure they listened to my phone, like they listened to all journalists' phone, but I, I don't think it was a very big priority because I never noticed anything in, in peculiar. But I was told... When the war started, uh, I was told by a person of, of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and this was the first time ever, and I've been in Russia since 2006, I was told by one of the curators that, but, but accurate, now be careful with what you write. And they had never told me anything like this before. And I think it was a, well, of course, it's a, it's a sort of threat. I mean, how can you interpret it otherwise? Uh, but, but it wasn't like, I mean... I, of course, I understood he 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 doesn't have FSB behind his back when he says it. He he was just trying to be a good, you know, employee and, and trying to make his job as as well as he could. In my case, I think you hear a lot of horror stories, and I've heard them from my colleagues too. I think maybe I was very lucky, I I or I didn't pay enough attention. That's <laughs> that's also a possibility. I just tried to, and I deliberately tried to pay as little attention to this because I felt like reporting there is hard enough as it is and it wasn't really going to make a difference you can't you know you can't uh, escape it so I just tried to work and and not pay attention to that my most negative experiences over the years but this is also before February last year was in the form of not even the authority so not someone in uniform in an official capacity even though I've had a lot of I've had a lot of problems with paperwork like low level paperwork registering at your address you know home address and things like that which it sounds like a technicality but you realize more and more especially since the beginning of the war that if you don't have the right uh piece of paper, they can use that as a pretext for something else. And I've had a lot of issues for some reason, maybe it's bad luck, with suddenly the system, with an error in the system, and it turns out that I wasn't registered after all, you know, things like that. Low-level, strange bureaucracy questions that could have consequences. But the times that I felt least safe has been in the form of, let's say, people's activists. So people with that, not in an official capacity harassing me or even at some point in Novosibirsk I was doing a story once and it was a story I went to a place where Navalny had filmed one of his videos about corruption in the construction sector and I went to that same neighborhood and before long I was just surrounded by this group of people supposedly they were residents but they were all you know, residents of that neighborhood, but they were all on their phones calling with people. And they literally started, I was with a camera person, they started touching us and hitting us and shouting, you know, we were just in, encircled by this angry, angry mob. And I literally ended up running away, <laughs> running away from there because there was just this feeling like there are no limits here. You know, this is going to turn into physical violence. And there was zero space for an actual dialogue or conversation. And mind you, this is before the war. It was a lot of, who sent you here, your agents of the West? 
spies, all of this language, and no one wanted to listen to the answers. So I understood that it didn't matter what I said or did. This was meant to, yeah, it was just like an angry mob and they're going to rip you to pieces. This is such a good example of how it becomes like when there's this propaganda machinery has been able to do its job for many, many, many years, and, and you are just placed into a role. And your role is to be the Western journalist, the Western stooge, the Western agent, and, and there's no chance in the world that you can explain for somebody who is who really actually believes this and who is very aggressive and angry that, that this isn't the case. You, you can't explain it. Yeah, absolutely. But that's what makes it so frustrating, right? Because you, you spend years c- committed, let's say, to a country, trying to learn more, trying to learn the language precisely so you can overcome this barrier. And then in situations like that, you get reduced to a very simplistic caricature of what your role is, which is that there's no difference between you and a Western spy. You you know, before I think it's so interesting what you said about we are at war and of course you're part of that war whether you want to or not. And I really, maybe you're right, but I really try to resist that also in my mind. And I, I think it's such a dangerous, I, I don't want to internalize that kind of label that's being stuck on you all the time by the Russian authorities because there is a huge difference. There's a fundamental difference between other, let's say, Western diplomats, Western spies, and Western journalists. Let's say we all have different jobs and we have different jobs to do. And probably all of those jobs are important. But of course, journalism is the most important job. But it's very, as you say, yeah, there's nothing you can do to fight that stigma. But I still resist it. I still, and I still reject it. The most important thing is not to internalize it. Uh, it's very difficult to pretend it doesn't exist, but I really all the time was trying to pretend it doesn't exist. And, uh, and on the same time, just in order for myself not to be crazy, I, I realized that I can't do anything about this because this is something, it's like a train which is running and, and I can't stop it, but I am not letting it you know, interfere in my job or letting me think that, okay, all Russians are, are just dependent on the televisions and they are all zombies. I, I hate this word, that all Russians are zombies. I, I hate this expression because I hear it all the time. Because it, it doesn't explain anything. You, you can say the whole country is a zombie. Okay, well, but let's forget about the whole country. I, I, I hate that as well. I don't want to be part of any sort of, you know, ready ideology or, 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 or listen, no, uh, rather like this dogmatic view on Russia or on anything. We are doing our job the best as we can. That's the most important thing. Why is it important that foreign journalists uh, continue their work inside Russia even during such a difficult period? And uh, what advice uh, would you give to foreign journalists who still work in Russia or those who want to report from inside Russia? I think why it's important to still report inside from Russia is because it's exactly what journalism is, is about. To be on the spot and to talk to the real people and see things for yourself. No, nothing can ever replace that. And as I said, when you are outside Russia, the country becomes a monster, unfortunately. It's, it's just a fact because all the information which comes, comes to you will only confirm that. And I really don't want to give any advice for them, those working in Russia. I just want to offer them my solidarity. Most of all, I I would just want to tell them that try not to, don't become part of this dogmatism we talked about. I know it's very difficult, but but try still to be a person and, and uh, try to pretend that how you are seen and so on, try to pretend it doesn't exist. Because if you are all the time thinking about how propagandists are seeing you and picturing you, you will, you will become crazy. Yeah, I could not agree more. Yeah, I think precisely this, it's so important to be on the ground. So actually, it's not even that I have advice. I just have a new found respect and it's convinced me even more how necessary it is. That's the paradox. The harder it is to report from Russia, the more important it becomes. I actually experienced it as a bit of a burden being there because I felt like there are so few of us. I have to stay, you know, I have to make sure that I do my bit because if for every person that leaves, it's one journalist less covering the story. And so I think it's super important that there are still people writing that story. And actually, I have to say, there are luckily dozens and dozens of journalists. So, you know, we tend to not think about, or people from smaller European countries don't get as much attention. We, But there are dozens of German correspondents and French and a Slovak correspondent, I think, and in Spanish and Italian, you know, there are a lot of people there. I have huge 
respect for what they do because it does come at a price, you know. It there is a sacrifice that you make to reporting in Russia. And then the only it's not even advice, but I do think on the other hand, as important as that task is, and this is not advice because this is what most people are doing anyway, but I certainly this was something I kept telling myself when I was in Moscow. At the end of the day, as much as it was my mission, I did keep thinking, especially after Evan's arrest, It is a personal decision. There is no right or wrong way about this. If people choose to leave because it's no longer worth the toll that it has on their personal life or their mental stability, peace, then that's completely okay and understandable too, considering the circumstances. Because at the end of the day, the risks that you run are personal risks and they're very, very high, you know? So for me, it was a constant struggle between those two, between the journalist in me thinking, this is a story that should be covered, it needs to be covered, we have to do it, you know? And then on the other hand, all of the foreign correspondents who are there and are making that sacrifice every day, they're also people. They have parents, they have families, they have children a lot of the time. And so I think that's the advice that I would give is remember, Once in a while, remember that you're a person too and you deserve a breather and maybe a spa day or a massage. <laughs> Treat yourself to an extra massage. That's my advice. Would you come back to report from Russia if you have a chance, if <laughs> there are some changes in Russia or you're already focused on something else right now? I would go back, of course. I mean, if and when things will change, because they will change, I don't know where I'll be at the moment. In a way, I might be wrong. Maybe it's because I was for such a long time in Russia. I was in Russia since 2006. But I don't feel I have I have said goodbye to Russia. I think I will return, but I don't know when. And right now, I will do other stuff. And I could be wrong. Maybe I will never go to Russia again, but I doubt it. I also don't have closure whatsoever, so it's quite fresh for me. It's not even what has been a month. I'm still thinking, my body still thinks that I'm about to go back. You know, I haven't completely internalized the fact that that's not going to happen in the near future. But the moment I can, to be honest, it's not in my hands. The moment it is, if it were my decision, I would be on the next flight back. So, yeah, let's see. When Moscow is ready to have me back, I'll be ready to, I think. A quick, interesting thing that it, that has struck me in the past year in general, but also now that I'm back in Europe, the one question I get from literally everyone I meet, no matter what their job is or what their interests are in life, everyone asks me about what Russians, ordinary Russians, as they call them, what Russians are thinking, what they're telling, what they told me behind closed doors. I mean, it's the most simple, basic question, but it's the question that everyone seems to have, you know, and it just, I think it really underscores the importance of precisely what we were talking about, of trying to answer that question and not with one piece, not in one go, but with continuous coverage of from within the country. So it's very important from a kind of abstract point of view, but there's also a lot, a lot of interest, I think, among readers and viewers and just Western populations, because I think they get a lot of the analysis on on the war in terms of the geopolitics and what's happening in the Kremlin and what's happening, you know, in Kiev. But what I really notice is that on a human level, people are struggling, are trying to understand what's happening and trying to place what's going on also with Russians and among the Russian population. So it just it's just emphasized for me how important it is the work that our colleagues are doing in Moscow. So big shout out to them for doing it. <laughs> 